Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about stochastic variational inference, and I'm going to give a review about um, this topic, and I'm going to go more into depth in the subsequent videos. So let's start with a recap. Uh, we covered a lot of ground so far. So the main problem is that we want to find the posterior, uh, but we can calculate the normalizing constant, the denominator as this part, in the posterior. And why? Because usually it's an intractable integral. Uh, Z can be multidimensional, and it's just too complicated. So what we do in VI, we pose a surrogate distribution, QZ, which is parameterized by some parameters. Let's call it theta for now. What we want to do, we want to find the optimal thetas here, the optimal parameters of this distribution that we put. Yeah, it could be a Gaussian, it could be a GMM can be whatever we want. And we want to find the optimal parameters by minimizing the distance between the posterior and this Q of Z, this surrogate distribution that we use. Since we don't have access to the normalizing constant, what we use is the KL divergence. So this distance that we use is the KL divergence. We use it in order to break away the normalizing constant and only use the joint, which we do have access to. And this is why we use the KL divergence and not some other distance matrix. So when we do the KL divergence, it looks like this, which translates to this, which can break away to this. Using base rule, we can break this into this thing. And this thing does not depend on Q. So when we optimize, we don't care about it. And these are the terms that do depend on uh, Q, on the parameters of Q. And uh, it's the minus elbow. So we try to maximize the elbow in order to minimize the KL divergence, the distance between the two distribution. A usual assumption we make is that QZ can factor into the product of the individual 1D dimensional ZJs. So if Z is multidimensional between uh, J1 and M, then we pose a different distribution on each one of it. Yes, yeah? so instead of having a joint distribution that takes captures all of the joint properties of these variables, we model each dimension by itself. And this is called mean field approximation. I made a video about this and what are the consequences of doing this. We are losing some accuracy with this assumption, with this simplification. And using this allowed us to um, derive the Cavi algorithm. And here it is in its original form. Within the exponential family, we saw we can simplify it to this thing over here, where we just update the natural parameter of each Q that we chose to be the expectation um, of the natural parameter with regards to all the other Z's all the other variables except the variable that we are currently looking at. Yeah, so this is so this is for the Jth optimal variable. Uh, with conjugate priors, we saw that the update goes like this, where we can basically break down the natural parameters into two. One will get this update, which is this, and the other one will get this update, which is this. Okay, so what's next? The literature continues in two main paths. So one path is stochastic variational inference for the exponential family. And this comes from a paper called Stochastic Variational Inference by Offman and Associates from 2013. And the stochasticity here comes from using partial data as we will see. But in my opinion, there's also stochastic variational inference in general. And this covers all kinds of algorithms, for example, black box variational inference, automatic differentiation variational inference, and other algorithms. And here, the stochasticity comes from MC integration. So I just want to note here, and this is right now my opinion, which I believe is right, that this paper called itself stochastic variational inference, but just because it called itself like this doesn't mean that it now owns the term. And you can use stochastic variations of variational inference. Most often it will be of gradient descent. Yeah, stochastic variation or gradient descent. And you can use it in many different ways. And if you use it in the context of VI, then what you're doing is stochastic VI, SVI. So 
Even though these algorithms are not called SVI, they have their own name, BBVI and ADVI and other names. Yeah, they are, in my opinion, part of stochastic variational inference in general, for the general case when you are not in the exponential family. Yeah, so this paper just dealt with really uh, a specific case of variational inference. Uh, there's also stochastic variational in general. If you talk to other people and you say stochastic variational inference, they might think you're only referring to this because this is the name of the paper. But again, in my opinion, what should be the correct way to view this is that there's stochastic variational inference on the exponential family, but then you can also do it in general. So let's dive in and give an outline. In the next videos, I'm going to dive in even more, but in this video, I'm just gonna give an outline, a review of each of these methods. So for the exponential family, we had Kavi, yeah, we had coordinate descent VI, which was good. We saw we can even simplify it even more. Yeah. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that with very large data sets, it requires iterating over the entire data set. So for example, in the Bayesian GMM example that we had, these were the formulas that we derived, the final formulas, yeah, for, for our problem. And note that here as this sum is over the entire data set. And it's the same sum here. And here we have to calculate another sum again over the entire data set. And here we calculate this term for each data point that we have. So that's a lot of calculations. So an alternative to coordinate descent is gradient-based optimization. For example, gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent is more scalable. So instead of using the whole data set, let's just use a sample of it. And this will be noisier, but cheaper to compute. So our gradients in this gradient-based optimization, when we do gradient descent, will be a bit more, more noisy, but easier to compute. So what we will see in the next video, and here I will just give an outline, is that we will do gradient descent. So we have to take the gradient of the elbow. The gradient in the exponential family has some nice properties. Uh, you can derive it in the general case. And then if we use the natural gradient, which is a term by itself, uh, it has even better theoretical properties and it's even easier to compute as we will see in the exponential case, yeah? Um, and then to do stochastic gradient descent, you just sample a data point or a sample from the full data set. You first update, for example, yeah, in, in here in this problem where we had local uh, variables, which were CIs, and we had global variables, which were mu's, yeah? So we first update the local parameter, the CI, and then you use that to update the mu, and this naturally extends to batches, and you basically just replace the sums here with a sample approximation. So this was SVI for the expo family. In general, when the problem is not in the expo family, then there's no close form general solution. So for each problem, you might have uh, some algorithm that you can derive, but it will be very specific to your problem. And so it's a lot of work. If you have a different problem, you might need a lot of work just to derive and find the way to do variational inference just to that problem. And the question is, can we do something better? So what we want to optimize uh, is the elbow. We want to maximize this elbow, right? What we want to do is two simplification that will allow us to scale. So first we want to do gradient descent. So we want to take the gradient of that with regards to the parameters of Q, right? Q is the variational family that we can control. We can control by changing the knobs of its parameters. It has parameters theta and we change it in order for it to be as close as possible to the posterior, or we do this by maximizing the elbow. So we change the theta in order to maximize the elbow. Note that each iteration, yeah, we will do this in iteration. So we start with some value of theta, and then we'll move around in the theta space in order to maximize the elbow. But in each iteration of theta, the current value of theta is known, and the distribution which you are using is known because you choose some approximate distribution, for example, a Gaussian or for example, a GMM. So these are knowns. And given that you've sampled from this distribution, the Z and you sample the ZI, then you can calculate the terms inside the expectation here, right? So the elbow is the expectation of this, but given that I have some ZI, I can calculate this because I assume I have access to the joint 
And again, of course, I have access to this distribution, which I choose, right, with the current value of the data. So I can calculate this. I can calculate the thing inside this elbow. So what I want to do is I want to use Monte Carlo estimates of this elbow, or more likely of the gradient of the elbow, and we will touch upon the gradient later, uh, instead of calculating the actual expected value because calculating the actual expected value will require an integral, which is most often intractable. So this means we are doing stochastic gradient ascent. The stochasticity comes from the MC integration. Yeah, this is where the stochasticity comes from. Okay, and it can also come also from, also sampling from the data, not using the whole data. As we will see in BBVI, they are also sampling from the data. So, Okay, this is what we want to do in general. Let's look at the gradient. We want to take the gradient of the elbow. The gradient of the elbow is simply, well, this is the elbow once we replace the expected value with what it is, which is just a weighted sum, basically. Yeah, so it's weighted sum of this value with this weights, uh, and you sum over all possible values of z. And we push the gradient into the integral. And this comes from Leibniz rule. Now, from here, there are two ways to proceed. The first is using the reparameterization trick. And this is what they do in uh, automatic differentiation VI. The second is using the log derivative trick, also known as reinforce. And this is what they do in BBVI. There was also a paper before BBVI by Wingate and Weber. And they are basically came up with the same solution with a little bit of a differences, but they, they basically came up with the same method uh, independently of each other. And in both ways, what we want to do is eventually uh, have the derivative only at what's inside the elbow and not of the term itself. The problem is that we are taking a derivative both of this term and it also affects this term over here. So that's a problem for us because if we could push the gradient inside the expectation, yeah, if we could just push the gradient inside here, uh, leaving this term outside uh, unharmed, then we can just do MC integration in, uh, instead of the expectation. We'll go more deep into this, so don't worry. So just a general view of the reparameterization trick, what we do is we are making a change of variables. We reparameterize uh, the, the, the distribution such that it's no longer depending on the parameters. What I mean is, for example, in a Gaussian, suppose Q of Z is Gaussians with mu and sigma square, the parameters are mu and sigma. If we now take, if we now standardize the, the variable, if we now call eta, uh, take it to be a function of Z, yeah, and we take it to be Z minus mu divided by uh, sigma, then Q of eta, uh, distributes standard normal, right? So now we can just sample from a standard normal and we push the all the dependencies over the parameters over mu and theta into inside here. So this has been replaced. Uh, we take it out and then we can just calculate. There will be some changes here. Yeah, there will be some dependence on theta here on the Z here, on the Z here, but it doesn't matter. It will work out as we will see. Okay, so what I mean is we start with this, we move to this new distribution, eta. Now Z is still dependent on, on theta, on the parameters we want, so we can write it like this, but, but it's okay, it will work out. A note here that this transformation usually requires multiplication of the determinant. Uh, in the Gaussian case, it just cancels out. So we normally we would have to also take the product with the determinant of the Jacobian, but it cancels out in the uh, Gaussian case. Again, this is just an outline. I will go more into it in the next video. Okay, why does this help? It simplifies the derivative, and now we can use MC integration to replace the expectation. So we sample from eta. Eta, for example, is the normal standard normal. We can sample from the standard normal without knowing what mu and sigma are. And then we calculate the terms in the expression, use the current values of mu and sigma that we have, calculate whatever inside the expectation, calculate the derivative of it, and all is well. 
the variance of this MC integration of the derivative is quite low, which means that the gradients are good. So the, the gradients approximations are good. And usually this is a simpler thing to do because the derivative itself was quite simple. So these are the pros of this approach. The con is that it's only applicable to models where you can use the reparameterization trick, which is not all problem. So not in all problems, you can use the reparameterization trick. Again, in the next videos, we will go more in depth. We will have a video about ADVI. The other possibility is use the log derivative trick. How do we do that? Well, we ended up with this, right? We are taking the derivative of after pushing it into the integral of this quantity. Now we are using the product rule. So we first take the derivative of this times whatever this is, and then we take this times the derivative of this. Okay, so this is exactly what I wrote here. And notice that the second term is actually equal to zero. It cancels out. Yeah, so this thing just cancels out. Why is that? Well, let's have a look. So we are taking the derivative of this first term times this second thing. So the first thing doesn't depend on theta at all. So there's just nothing there. Yeah? This cancels out. And now we are taking the derivative of the minus log Q theta of Z. So the derivative of a log is one over the quantity. And now we have to multiply it by the derivative of the actual quantity and multiply it by whatever is left. This was what left. So we are multiplying by it. But now these terms cancels out and we are left with this thing. We can take the derivative outside of the integral. So it's again, um, a reverse Leibniz rule, if you wish. And this is a valid distribution. So the integral of it sums to one, and then we are taking a derivative of a constant. So it's just zero. So this is why this whole thing cancels out. In the first term, we actually use the log derivative trick. And what is the log derivative trick? The log derivative trick is the gradient of some distribution is equal to that distribution times the derivative of the log of that distribution, right? So if we take the derivative of the log, it's again, one over uh, Q theta of Z times the derivative of Q Z, right? And so if we multiply it by Q theta of Z, these terms cancel and we are left only with the derivative. Why do we want to do this? Again, to do MC integration. So we use the log derivative trick to replace this thing with this thing. We are left with this. Now we can go back to having an expectation. Yeah. So instead of an integral times this, we are doing the expectation. And now we just have the derivative of this times this quantity over here. And this is a quantity that we know given theta, the current values of theta, we can calculate the log of it and then take the derivative of it with regards to theta. It's not a problem. These quantities, again, we only need the z's. So we will sample z's from our variational distribution get, using the current values of theta. And then we'll calculate a noisy version of the gradient of the elbow. So we will replace the gradient with this thing. Instead of an expectation, we do this. And then we simply update the parameter value at like this. Alpha is the learning rate or step size or whatever you want to call it. And it doesn't have to be fixed. Usually it's also adaptive. So the problem with this is that the variance of the gradient can be too high. So what it means, it means that this gradient approximation is bad. So sometimes you will sample a few and you will get a certain value. And then you will uh, sample other z's and you will get a completely different value. So the variance of the different values that you will get from here are quite big. And so it's not useful. The solutions are that there are ways to reduce this variance. And we will look into them when we discuss BBVI and other papers in a subsequent video. So this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.